I am here to introduce our speaker for the night, Melanie Williams. And since I am hopefully among friends, I will be honest with you. When Melanie first asked if I would introduce her, I kind of flippantly said, yes, of course, I'd be honored, absolutely no problem. And uh, just kind of figured that I'd whip something up and it would be good. But when I actually sat down to kind of jot down some notes, I couldn't write out any old thing um, and feel good about it. So. You see, Melanie is one, is a friend and a mentor to me. So I wanted to say something that was worthy of her and not just any old words would do. So I am going to inform you all how I see Melanie and hopefully I do her justice. First, I want to emphasize the importance of multi-generational relationships. Whether you consider it more mentorship or friendship, it's a necessary exchange. I firmly believe that these are some of the most rewarding relationships we can have in our Christian walk. We are not meant to do this life alone, and we all need someone to we, that we can trust who can give us some objective wisdom from time to time. Biblically, we are also called to have such relationships. Antioch has given me so much. It has trained me, it's been an iron rod when I needed it, and also been wide open loving arms when I didn't deserve. But on top of all that, the type of relationships that I have been blessed and able to cultivate here at Antioch is something that I treasure. And I really do and love appreciate this church. And we are lucky to have people like Melanie in the sometimes literal trenches of our mission ministry. Melanie is one of these, is it mentorship or is it friendship type of people? And I hold her very near and dear to my heart. And I don't know how it started, but I guess maybe serving together in Apex, although I'm pretty sure that my mother had some sort of grandmaster puppeteer placement uh, going on. She knew that I needed Melanie. Um, and before that, I knew Melanie as Zahara's mom, mostly, and I kept telling Zahara, you have like a cool mom. She's not a regular mom. She's one of those cool moms, so you just need to get over it. I'm gonna be friends with your mom. <laughs> um, but we served in the high school ministry together for three years, and to say I learned a lot from her would be the understatement of the night. Melanie would be the first to admit it, so I don't think that she would mind me saying it, hopefully not, but she has not lived a necessarily comfortable, cushy life. And it is her story to tell if she pleases, but if I put it plainly, the girl's seen some stuff. Honestly, who hasn't? But the difference I see in Melanie is that she has handed all of that over to the Lord, and in return, God gave her one of the most beautifully deep souls that I have the pleasure of knowing. She gave God whatever dirt she had, and her soul is now an oasis. She listens without judgment, chastises without adding insult to injury, and laughs. Melanie knows how to have a good time. And anytime she tells me how old she is, I call her a liar. <laughs> her age is non-existent. Melanie is a graceful picture of honesty, and the way she cares for others is something to behold. The best way I can put it is fierce. She fiercely loves and cares for those God puts in her path. And I'm sure you'll hear her heart when she shares. And I really don't know all of what she's going to share, but at the end of it, I bet you will be able to get a picture of her heart for people. So without further ado, I introduce Melanie Williams. We have a little Christmas tradition in our family that I don't know how it started, but generally we usually give our kids like three gifts. And we number them one through three, and we start off with something practical that they need anyway, like socks. And then um, we move on to like a practical or educational want, like maybe their favorite book series. And then we finish off number three with something that they really were hoping for, like I don't know, an Xbox. And, and in that order of succession, there's gratitude and growing excitement and 
But what if we gave them the same three gifts in random order, and they opened the books, and then the Xbox, and the socks were last? Probably be a little disappointment. Oh, it's all the socks. That's it, we're done. Oh, well, I'm gonna go set up my Xbox. So, same three gifts, but what's the difference between excitement and disappointment? I would say in one word, expectation. We let our expectations get in the way and sometimes uh, get us in trouble. On my invite for tonight, I had written, don't you just love gifts, especially when they're unexpected? Of course, some gifts are better than others, but James 1.17 tells us that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Sometimes the packaging isn't what we're looking for. Perhaps it's too small or oddly shaped or plainly wrapped. So we don't realize that there's a gift inside just waiting to be discovered. Maybe there's nothing wrong with the wrapping. Maybe it's, you just need to change your perspective and learn how to embrace the unexpected gift. My original title for this was The Gift of Pain, but I didn't think anybody would come to that. So I wrote down a few other ideas and uh, prayed about it until the unexpected gift is what kind of popped out. And then later the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, pain is not the unexpected gift, which is kind of where I was going. Um, but it's merely the wrapping that the unexpected gift is in. We have to go through the pain to get to the gift. That made me think of um, Zechariah 13.9, which says, God is saying, uh, I will bring them through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested. They will call on my, upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, these are my people, and they will see the, say, the Lord is my God. I don't know about you, but that doesn't really sound like a good time to me. Um, gold and silver don't really look like much when they first come out of the ground, and they have to go through a process of really hot heat uh, so that all the dirt and gunk falls off. And then what you're, what you're left with is this beautiful silver, gold. It's beautiful, it's valuable, but it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that you have to go through to get to that point. And so it is with us. Um, for those of you who've grown up in the church or you've been in church a long time, you know that usually people's conversion story is like a nice, neat one, two, three, like my life before I met Christ, how I met Christ, and how my life is since. Kind of like socks, books, Xbox. <clears throat> my story is a little out of order. It's more like books, Xbox, socks, dirty socks, and then Xbox again. So when I was a kid, I started going to church when I was like nine with my mom, and, um, and I heard the gospel, and it was really clear to me, and I, it just made a lot of sense, and I, and I heard that God had created us for relationship, but we walked away from him, and that built a wall between us, a wall that we could build, but we couldn't tear down. God's desire for relationship just remained the same, and so... And this is where I think Christianity is really different from every other religion in the world. Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, Catholicism. All of it says that the way to God, to heaven, to eternity, to paradise is by your good works. And Christianity is the only place that you're going to hear God say, it's not about you. You're never going to be good enough. And so God said, I'm going to come down there and I'm going to do it perfectly. And then I'm going to pay the price for you. And he came down and he lived a perfect sinless life and he died on the cross and he resurrected back to life, which restored that bridge so we could have a relationship with him. He took our shame and traded it for honor. He took our sin and traded it for righteousness. And yeah, I wanted that. I wanted that. What I didn't understand was how to have a relationship with him once that happened. And so I allowed lies to keep me in bondage for a long time after that. So I'm going to share my story, and I hope that if any of you hear yourself in it, that you'll come to realize that God himself, the perfect gift giver, is in the business of forgiving and healing and restoring and building relationship and loving. Um, I was sexually abused from the time I was eight until I was 19, off and on. I had multiple abusers, male and female, so I was all kinds of jacked up. And uh, 
when I got saved, I heard that gospel message. I knew I was saved. But my perspective was, well, life sucks. But at least I could do it to heaven when I die. And, um, and the abuse continued. And then um, it wasn't really ever good at anything. It was no, no particular talent or skill. I wasn't pretty. I wasn't popular. I wasn't, couldn't sing. I couldn't play an instrument. I wasn't academically smart. And when it came to sports, forget about it. Uh, so I wasn't really good at anything. And I started to really just believe that my identity was in my sexuality. And that, that was really all I had to offer. And when I was 14 and a half, my mom asked me if I wanted to take a jazz dance class. And I thought, yeah, sure, why not? Got nothing better to do. And that first class, all the pieces fell in place. All, everything clicked and everything seemed right with the world. And I thought, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I quickly began to excel past everybody else in my class. And my teacher took me aside and said, if you're really serious about this, you should take ballet. So the next year, I added ballet. And the year after that, I went to a more advanced school. And by the end of that spring, I had auditioned at Cornish, which is a performing arts college in Seattle. And they offered me a scholarship. And I, I ended up going my senior year like a, a running start kind of a thing. I used to tell my students in my small group that I invented running start. You're welcome. <laughs> I didn't really. But it didn't exist. And so I had to like clear it with the school you know, superintendent and everything. So my senior year, I went to Cornish, and I took dance classes, and they counted towards my electives to graduate. And I became absolutely driven to succeed because it was the first thing that I ever felt had value in my life. Um, and I just became obsessive, basically. So I get to Cornish, and now I'm dancing with people who've been dancing since they were two years old, and I've only been dancing two years. So I was curvy and um, didn't have a ballerina body. Um, more like a Vegas showgirl body, so <laughs> it didn't really translate well. So my teachers yelled at me and humiliated me about losing weight. I was about 20 pounds lighter than I am now. But um, so they thought that would motivate me to humiliate me and yell at me, which it motivated me. I just didn't know what to do. So uh, if any of you who know me, <clears throat> you know how much I geek out over nutrition, especially looking at nutrition from a biblical worldview. And uh, so, but back then I knew nothing. <laughs> so I just ate less, and they still yelled at me, so I ate less. And then my second year, <clears throat> a friend had introduced me to her secret, and that was laxatives. So um, I'd eat about 500 calories a day. We danced 36 hours a week, by the way. So six hours a day, six days a week. And um, I'd eat about 500 calories a day. But Saturday, after rehearsal was over, we would go shopping and we'd buy all the food that we'd been craving all week and we would each take a box of laxatives and then eat the food and then it would liquefy and we would almost die and then we'd lose five pounds. And um, so uh, it, 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 it seemed to work for a while. But then, um, <clears throat> then I ran into my uncle and I was feeling really confident at this point in my life. I was you know, dancing and I was working, I was an independent woman. And, um, and I confronted him. Um, he'd come into the restaurant where I worked. And I told him, hey, you should uh, come over and check out my apartment and, um, when I get off work. And he always told me that I would never amount to anything without him. So I was going to show off my life. Dumb. So uh, yeah, he came over. And, uh, and I confronted him. And I told him, like, what you had done to me was wrong. And it was abuse. And, um, and he got violent. And I'd never seen that side of him. He grabbed me by the throat and he slammed my head up against the wall. And that's when I realized, hmm, it's like 2 in the morning and I live alone. <laughs> All this independent life I was showing off is getting me in trouble now. So, um, and I thought, nobody's here to help me. And then something just switched in his eyes and he let go and he left. And I was like, holy cow. Okay, so... Um, at that moment, I, I resolved in my heart, I will never let another man take advantage of me or have any power over me as long as I live. It wasn't a really healthy resolve because I wasn't depending on the Lord, it was depending on me. And um, I decided I was going to be in control and I was going to be tough and strong. And um, what it really was was kind of a hoe. <laughs> and, um, but I thought I was in control of it, so I made everything okay. 
And, um, and I continued like that for a while and uh, started seeing a guy at, that I worked with and he um, would come over, at, we'd get, go home together after shift and he would get high and I would talk. And it was an opportunity to just talk and somebody would to listen or pretend like he was listening. And um, had this whole like chemistry set thing going on that he would do and I wouldn't really pay, I, whatever, didn't think about it. One day I asked him, so what is this thing that you're doing? What is all this that you do? And he's like, um, it's freebasing cocaine, like I'm making cocaine from powder to liquid to solid so I can freebase it. And I was like, now I'm gonna date myself. I was like, isn't that how Richard Pryor caught on fire? And uh, he goes, yeah, yeah, but he was using a blowtorch. This is a butane lighter, it's perfectly safe. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so he's like, you want to try it? And I was like, no, I'm good. I I'd never smoked a cigarette. I'd never smoked weed. I'd never, I'd had a little bit of alcohol. I'd never been drunk at this point. Clueless. So every once in a while he would ask and I would say no. And then one day I was like, ah, sure, why not? And, uh, it was a little overwhelming. <laughs> and, um, then I thought, yeah, I want to do that again. So I started smoking pretty much all, all as much, not daily, but pretty close for like five months. And uh, the reason why was I didn't think about food when I was high. And so I could stop doing the laxatives and all of that business because I had this like way to hit the pause button on thinking about food. Food was, I was obsessed with thinking about food every moment of every day. And suddenly that felt like freedom until one night I spent my whole bank account and I woke up the next day and realized my rent is due and I don't have any money and I don't have any reason not to have money. I can't ask my parents and panic. And I, I started to pray and I just thought, oh, I don't deserve for God to help me. So I, I just got in the shower. I had a good cry. When I got out of the shower, the phone was ringing and it was a friend of mine who was a believer. And he said, he's telling me how great his job is going and everything's awesome. He was uh, salesman of the month, two months in a row, and he's making all this money. And I, I didn't want to talk to him because I think just the fact that he was a Christian and I was convicted, I didn't, mm, I didn't want to talk to him. So I was really rude and <clears throat> really cold on the, and unresponsive on the phone. And then, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, after like an awkward silence, he goes, um, so, okay, uh, yeah, um, well, the reason why I'm calling, um, yeah, I woke up this morning and... Uh, okay, well, well, God put it on my heart um, to share this money with somebody who could really use it. And would you be offended if I paid your rent this month? Uh, pff, no, I wouldn't be offended. Like, you know, yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's cool. So, um, yeah, he came to my job that night at the restaurant and handed me $300 cash. That's what rent was a million years ago. <laughs> and... Um, I stuck it in my pocket and I kept feeling it all night like, like I was afraid it was going to disappear or something and every drug dealer I knew came into the restaurant that night every single one of them but I knew God was throwing me a lifeline I knew I had one shot at this I paid my rent the next day never touched drugs again and I know the Lord just delivered me from that because I had so much other junk to deal with he was like we'll just give you a freebie on this one we'll just take that away so you don't have to yeah, so um, then I thought, okay, I'm gonna get my life together now. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do good and I'm gonna just get it all together. And then I saw my uncle again. And the next day I found myself in the drugstore in the laxative aisle. Thank you. And I picked this box up and, and the Lord just spoke to me so clearly. I just don't know how to describe what that is, but if you haven't had that happen, but I just like a sense of what he's saying. And he said, you were abused and that was bondage. And so dance felt like freedom until the food, until the weight issue became an obstacle. And then the eating disorder felt like freedom until the eating disorder was bondage. And then the drugs felt like freedom and so when are you going to stop trading one slave master for another and just surrender to me? And I put the box back, and I went home. 
And I started seeing a Christian psychologist who was able to deal with all of my mess from a clinical perspective, which I needed, but also for, through a, a biblical worldview. And, um, and then the Lord and I started the long journey of healing and restoring our relationship and restoring my life. And sometimes processing through the junk and counseling is worse than actually going through the junk. Because you can kind of, you're in a fog and you kind of just check out emotionally when all the stuff is happening to you. But in the cold light of day of a counselor's office, you gotta sift through it all and look at it and deal with it. But the unexpected gift that comes out of that is that it no longer has power over you and the enemy can't use it to haunt you with your past. You're no longer a victim, but you're a victor. Another unexpected gift was that my dad became a Christian. He was not a believer, but he, he was just a nice guy. Like when we started going to church when I was a kid, he told my mom, yeah, you can go, just don't ask me to go. Um, he was a nice guy, he didn't think he needed a savior, but he realized being a nice guy didn't protect me. And I think that was what the Lord used to kind of draw him to himself. And in the end, in heaven, it's not gonna matter what the bad stuff that happened in my life, but it's gonna matter that my dad is there. Of course, the best unexpected gift was my husband. I didn't think. I didn't think any man would want me for a wife. And after our first date, I told him, I got some things to tell you. <laughs> and I just laid it all out for him because I thought I would rather have him leave now than for me to get attached to him. Never been attached emotionally to a man before. But I realized there was something different about him. And even after that first date, I was like, yeah, I could really fall for this guy. And so I'd rather him leave now before I get in too deep. So I just laid it all out for him, and a funny thing happened. He didn't leave. He just looked me dead in the eye and said, okay. <laughs> and if you know Todd, <laughs> that doesn't surprise you. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's walked through some pretty dark times with me, um, but God has really used him in I, just indescribable ways. I do not deserve that man. And um, next month we will celebrate the 29th anniversary of our first date. <laughs> the Lord also blessed me with an unexpected gift of serving 21 years in youth ministry. And uh, I had the opportunity to share my story with many, many young women that I mentored and give, hopefully gave them the hope that they didn't have to go down the same road that I did. And if even one, if it made a difference for one, it's worth it. I know people say that, it's such a cliche thing to say, but really, it's an honor to be able to have been able to share and pour into the lives of so many girls for so many years and how much they've blessed me, that was a gift. God also restored the opportunity for a career in dance. I ended up becoming, um, directing a dance ministry for the youth ministry that we were involved in at our previous church for 10 years. And then I had choreography jobs came from that and teaching, so I was able to make money. And I, just, I didn't think that God would restore dance in my life. And these are just a few examples of the many, many, many unexpected gifts that the Lord has brought through my pain. Um, yeah, I could be up here for hours, but, um, and even though I can't promise you specific outcomes, then we, we get back to the beginning when I was saying about expectations cause disappointment. So hence the unexpected gift. I think our, our, um, our expectations, like I said, they can get us in trouble. So even though I can't promise you specific outcomes, I can promise you that God has tremendous gifts for you if you give him your pain. He is faithful with it and he's gonna bring things in your life beyond what you could ask or imagine. Sometimes though, when we fixate on, I want this thing though, Lord, we'd miss what he is bringing into our lives. So he will trade your sadness for joy. He will trade your, your, your mourning for dancing, your beauty for ashes when you trust him with your pain. Keep in mind all these beautifully wrapped gifts on this stage, they're empty. 
So uh, a lot of times what sparkles out on the outside, what looks good on the outside, doesn't really have anything to fulfill us. And a lot of times what God has doesn't really look that exciting on the outside. But when you, when you, when you press into him, you might, you're going to be amazed at what's in there. What's in there is totally worth it. He doesn't owe us anything, and we do get in trouble when we let our expectations creep in. We have to be willing to come to him with our hearts open to whatever it is that he did, decides is best. And it's not always what we want. There's this song, that, well, lyrics to this song that I love. I don't love the song, but I love the lyrics. And it describes the oxymoron of our desires. It says, just how close can I get, Lord, to my surrender without losing all control? We're fearless warriors in a picket fence, reckless abandon wrapped in common sense, deep water faith in the shallow end, and we are caught in the middle. With eyes wide open to the differences, the God we want and the God who is, but will we trade our dreams for his? Or are we caught in the middle? Will we trade our dreams for his? That's hard. But I would encourage you to let go of your expectations and give yourself totally to God with reckless abandon. The greatest freedom I've ever known is being fully surrendered to God. And that doesn't mean I do it perfectly. And, and I'll tell you, I struggle with trusting him still. My family will tell you. <laughs> I'm the first one to be like, God has a plan, and I mean it, and I know it, and I believe it. And then as soon as things go wrong that affect me, I'm like, oh, panic. So I, it's hard, and it's something that we just, I need to be reminded of regularly, that God is faithful, God is faithful, God is faithful. He is sovereign. He's in control of all of it. And if I can just surrender that to him and be able to be willing to trade my dreams for his and be okay with that, such freedom, such freedom. And that, my friends, that relationship that comes, that is forged in that pain, that relationship we have with God, that is the ultimate gift. So thank you for your time. <laughs>